everybody. Um, welcome to lesson one, day one of Couch Classroom, which is my YouTube series um, for how I'm going to teach lessons while I don't get to see you. Um, just kind of the format for how we'll do this. All your assignments will be on Google Classroom, but the YouTube videos will serve to either preface something that you'll need to know before doing the work on Google Classroom or it will explain something after. Um, and I'll make sure I label like, watch this before, watch this after, um, in hopes that that is, makes everything a little clearer. This is obviously a work in progress, so if there's anything I can do to change it, make it better, please tell me. Um, I've never been a YouTube teacher before. So we're in this together. Um, a couple other things, let's see here. Number one, uh, I did send all of you an email um, checking up on you. If you could respond to that at your convenience, that would be great. Um, two, if you've got any questions on assignments on Google Classroom or if you need uh, stuff printed out, please uh, let me know as soon as you can and I will help you out with that. Um, I think in this insane uh, time in human history that we're all living through, it's helpful to maintain as much normalcy as we can. Um, and so the YouTube videos will also kind of serve as if we were in class, what would we be doing? Um, and I'm talking like, I greeted you just like I always do. And you know what I say next? How are you guys? Good, 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 terrible. And then I'll say, oh, why are you terrible? And you'll say, I'm tired. And I'll say, well, I hope that you wake up because uh, we've got a lot of fun stuff going on. And then what else did I say? If you could take out that other earbud, I'd appreciate it. I know it's not on. I would just appreciate if they were both out of your ears. Thank you so much. And then I would say, as long as you eat your hot Cheetos really quickly, and if you put any, if you leave anything on the ground, you use the mini broom to, to clean it up. You can still eat them. I'd prefer you were eating something else at this hour, but it's a weird time. And if there's ever a time that you can eat hot Cheetos for breakfast, a global pandemic is it. Um, then I would say today's lesson is brought to you by Instagram dog of the day. And Instagram, first of all, why so many thumbs up already? I'm really not sure. I'm weird on YouTube. Um, and in real life honest. Um, so I don't want to use any of the pets that you guys have sent me on emails because I'm holding out hope that I'll get to see you in person and we'll get to celebrate your dog and you'll get to tell us all about uh, him or her at school on the Google Slides and we can all say aww and appreciate your pet together. So I'm going to pull a couple of my favorite Instagram dogs and today's Instagram dog I've already used him before, but I think we could all enjoy Lil Hobbs in a sweater one more time. If you remember, Lil Hobbs is a Chihuahua rescue, and he's on a weight loss journey. And if you are lucky, you might catch his Insta story of him doing his water workout, or you might see him on the treadmill running, running is a loose term. Um, but Obviously, he's a beautiful angel, and if you need a smile today, lil.hobbs on Instagram is where you can find him. Um, then what else would I do? I would tell you get all your stuff out. So what you need out today is your To Kill a Mockingbird book. And really, that's it. If you want the assignment out too, that's fine. Um, but today, and you're going to see this YouTube and be like, Miss Guthier, why is this 45 minutes long? I am not watching one of these every day. Don't worry. This is the only long one um, because I read the first chapter of a book with you and the last chapter. So um, if if you're like, ah, that's a lot. Um, I promise you most of the videos I'm planning on being like 10 to 15 minutes tops. Um, but if you don't have your book yet, if you could give me uh, – tell me in some way. Um, I'm working on calling people later today that were absent on the Friday before break um, to make sure everybody has what they need. But um, if you don't have it today, it's okay to just listen, um, but try to get a copy of the book or let me know you need one ASAP. 
Um, the other thing you'll need is, and I'm going to try to superimpose this onto the video, um, but if I can't, uh, you need to know three things before we start reading. Um, so this is chapter one, and in chapter one, I want you to pay attention to purpose, characterization, and illusion. Um, purpose, and purpose is kind of a, it's a much more, um, detailed definition in later grades um, when you get there. But for the purpose of knowing literary purpose right now, I want you to know that purpose is the reason that an author is using certain words um, or certain devices. So if you're not reading something that's like propelling the plot in some way and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to turn this page right away and know what happens. Um, the the words and the devices used are are probably doing something else. Remember during Dear Evan Hansen, my one beat people, when I was like in a in a theater production, you have two hours to make your point. So every song, every word is is gonna be something that we want to analyze. And that's kind of what I want you to think about too, especially if we're in a part in the chapter and you're like, this seems long and boring. There's a reason that the editor didn't take it out. So just make sure you remember that. Um, also, characterization. So we're going to meet a couple people today, but the three main ones are going to be our narrator. Her name is Scout, her brother Jem, and their friend Dill. Um, I want you, remember that characterization is the process by which a character is revealed. And what I want you to do is try to just get first impressions of those three characters. Um, do you like them? Do you not like them? What kind of people do they seem like? That kind of stuff. Um, and then illusion is going to be a reference to something outside of the text. Um, so it can be a historical figure, um, a pop culture icon, um, a historical time period, and and. I think probably the most accessible place for you guys to see illusion is going to be rap songs. So in like 15 years when some rappers like I'm um, taking down the rap game like coronavirus. Um, I'm sure you guys would have reacted exactly the same to that joke, even if you were here. Um, so I went on a limb. I tried it. Joke failed. I'm seven minutes into the video, so I'm not going to change it. But I feel like you probably get what I mean by illusion now. So anyway, um, you want to pay attention to those three things when we read uh, today. And with no further ado, let's go on ahead and get started. Um, if you would note that part one um, is what we start with. There are two parts to this novel. The Part one is, is mainly uh, those three characters and their like childhood experiences. Um, part two is, which actually I don't want to tell you too much about part two, but it is divided for a reason. And we'll get there when we get there. Um, let's see here. The story starts in the summer of 1933 and it ends in 1935. So what you guys remember about um, the 30s, it's Great Depression era. Uh, you guys did such a beautiful job on those web quests and those grades will be in soon. Um, but just make sure that you're picturing, remember to had you look at that photo gallery of what the 1930s looked like. That's kind of the, that's the mood that we're setting um, when we read this novel. Um, otherwise, let's go ahead and get started. My computer's about to fall, sorry. When he was nearly 13, my brother Jem got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed and Jem's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right when he stood or walked. The back of his hand was at right angles to his body, his thumb parallel to his, so to his thigh. He couldn't have cared less so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintain the Yules started it all, but Jem, who was four years my senior, four years older, said it started long before that. He said it began the summer Dill came to us when Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. I said that if you wanted to take a broad view of the thing, it really began with Andrew Jackson. If General Jackson hadn't run the creeks, which were referencing um, the Native American tribe, up the creek, Simon Finch would have never paddled up the Alabama, and where would we be if he hadn't? 
We were far too old to settle an argument with a fist fight, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. Wade, why do they call their dad by their first name? Good question. We'll talk about it later. Being Southerners, it was a source of shame to some members of the family that we had no recorded ancestors on either side of the Battle of Hastings. All we had was Simon Finch, a fur-trapping apothecary from, from Cornwall, whose piety was exceeded only by his stinginess. Piety is religious um, reverence, and stinginess, you know, is what stinginess is. So the only thing he was more of that, what, than religious was being greedy and stingy. In England, Simon was irritated by the persecution of those who called themselves Methodists at the hands of their more liberal brethren, and as Simon called himself a Methodist, he worked his way across the Atlantic to Philadelphia, thence to Jamaica, thence to Mobile, up the St. Stephen's, and up the St. Stephen's. Mindful of John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, he worked his way, nope, Mindful of John Wesley's strictures on the use of many words in buying and selling, Simon made a pile practicing medicine. But in this pursuit, he was unhappy, lest he be tempted into doing what he knew was not for the glory of God as the putting on of gold and costly apparel. So Simon, having forgotten his teacher's dictum, instruction, on the possession of human chattels, slaves, bought three slaves with their, and with their aid established a homestead on the banks of the Alabama River, some 40 miles above the St. Stephen's. He returned to St. Stephen's only once to find a wife and with her established a line that ran high to daughters. Simon lived to an impressive age and died rich. Okay, so that's one of those purpose paragraphs I wanted to tell you guys about. I'm not gonna stop too much, but if, if you're like, whoa, that seems like a lot of information I don't care about, here's what we need to know. We're getting something about our narrator's ancestor, Simon Finch. We're getting where he settled after he left England because of religious persecution. And we're getting that he um, lived there his whole life and died rich. Those are kind of our, our main notes about that paragraph. What I want you to, to start noting, though, especially, is how important and how often referenced ancestry, land ownership, and um, like um, your lineage, which is like your, your familial tree. Um, and remember, Southern Gothic is all about uh, the, some of those elements. Well, not some. It is, it refer Southern Gothic it pays attention to those elements. So just that's why I want to make sure we, we noted that. It was customary for the men in the family to remain on Simon's homestead, Finch's Landing, and make their living from cotton. The place was self-sufficient, modest in comparison with the empires around it. The landing nevertheless produced everything required to sustain life except ice, wheat flour, and articles of clothing supplied by riverboats from Mobile. Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and the South, an allusion to the Civil War, which is also a euphemism, as it left his descendants stripped of everything but their land. Yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the 20th century, when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law, and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister, Alexandra, was the Finch who remained at the landing. She married a taciturn, not very talkative, man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trot lines were full. When my father was admitted to the bar, not like you're 21, you can come in kind of bar, um, the, the test you have to pass to become a lawyer, he returned to Maycomb to begin his practice. Maycomb, some 20 miles east of Finch's Landing, was the county seat of Maycomb County. Atticus's office in the courthouse contained little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, a checkerboard, and an unsullied coat of Alabama. His first two clients were the last two persons ha hanged in the Maycomb County Jail. Atticus had urged them to accept the state's generosity in allowing them to plead guilty to second-degree murder and escape with their lives, but they were Haverfords in Maycomb County, a name synonymous with. The Haverfords had dispatched which is a euphemism for killed, Maycomb's leading blacksmith in a misunderstanding arising from the wrongful det detention of a mayor, were imprudent enough to do it in the presence of three witnesses and insisted that the son of a had it coming to him was a good enough defense for anybody. They persisted in pleading not guilty to first degree murder. So there was nothing much Atticus could do for his clients except to be present at their departure. 
an occasion that was probably the beginning of my father's profound distaste for the practice of criminal law. Um, which, by the way, that's why I wore my shirt today. Um, so Atticus is our narrator's dad. He's a lawyer. We know that he dislikes criminal law. Now remember, there's a lot of different kinds of law. The criminal law is the kind you see on like law and order. Somebody commits a wrongdoing, they go to court, there are witnesses, um, cross-examination, um, that kind of stuff. And then they're going to be the ones that are going to get the super uh, punitive consequences. So being hanged, put to death, prison, etc. Um, so his two clients who uh, he represented uh, killed someone in broad daylight in front of witnesses and insisted that he deserved it was a great um, uh, defense uh, for why they killed him. And Atticus is like, can you not? And they did it anyway. They were convicted. They were hanged. And what we're probably characterizing from Atticus there is that, first of all, he doesn't like criminal law, which we've already said. And second of all, um, well, maybe I don't want to say it quite yet, but like, what kind of a lawyer do you maybe picture him to be then. We'll get back to that. During his first five years in Maycomb, Atticus practiced the economy more than anything. For several years thereafter, he invested his earnings in his brother's education. John Hale Finch was 10 years younger than my brother and chose to study medicine at a time when cotton was not worth growing. But after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked Maycomb. He was Maycomb County born and bred. He knew his people. They knew him. And because of Simon Finch's industry, Atticus was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. It reminds me of the town I went to uh, or where, where I lived um, in high school. Everybody's related to everybody. I know someone who almost married their cousin. Maycomb was an ool. For this one, I want you to close your eyes and try to picture Maycomb. Maycomb was an old town. But it was a tired old town when I first knew it. In rainy weather, the streets turned a red slop. Grass grew on the sidewalks. The courthouse sagged in the square. Somehow it was hotter then. A black dog suffered on a summer's day. Bony mules hitched to hoover carts flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon after their three o'clock naps and by nightfall were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. People moved slowly then. They ambled across the square, shuffled in and out of the stores around it, took their time about everything. A day was 24 hours long, but seemed longer. There was no hurry. hurry. There was nowhere to go, nothing to buy, no money to buy it with, nothing to see outside the boundaries of Maycomb County. But it was a time of vague optimism for some of the people. Maycomb County had recently, be, recently been told that it had nothing to fear but fear itself. Okay, open your eyes for me. At this point in class, I'd be like, hey, what kind of town is Maycomb? And everyone's like, boring. And I'm like, would you want to live there? No. Could you imagine living there? In every other uh, time that I've taught this, everyone was like, no, I could never imagine living somewhere so, so boring. Some text-to-life connection here. I bet you can all imagine living somewhere so boring because nowhere to go, nothing to buy, and watching all the hours slowly pass is probably something we can empathize with um, a little bit more than uh, other generations because uh, that's kind of what self-isolation feels like. Um, so it's a very slow-moving town. Not much happens, and... Um, it's very, I think I already said small, didn't I? I can't rewind, so it's small, boring. We lived on the main residential street in town, Atticus Gemini, plus Calpurnia, our cook. Gemini found ourself, or our father, satisfactory. He played with us, read to us, and treated us with courteous detachment. Calpurnia was something else again. She was all angles and bones. She was nearsighted. She squinted. Her hand was wide as a bed slat and twice as hard. She was always ordering me out of the kitchen, asking me why I couldn't behave as well as Jim, when she knew he was older, and calling me home when I wasn't ready to come. Our battles were epic and one-sided. Calpurnia always won, mainly because Atticus always took her side. She had been with us ever since Jem was born, and I had felt her tyrannical presence as long as I could remember. Our mother died when I was two, so I never felt her absence. She was a Graham from Montgomery. Atticus met her when he was first elected to the state legislature. 
He was middle-aged then. She was 15 years his junior, 15 years younger. Jem was the product of their first year of marriage. Four years later, I was born, and two years later, our mother died from a sudden heart attack. They said it ran in her family. I did not miss her, but I think Jem did. I rem he remembered her clearly, and sometimes in the middle of a game, he would sigh at length, then go off and play by himself behind the car house. When he was like that, I knew better than to bother him. When I was almost six and Jem was nearly ten, our summertime boundaries within calling distance of Calpurnia were Mrs. Henry Lafayette DeBose's house two doors to the north of us and the Radley Place three doors to the south. We were never tempted to break them. The Radley Place was inhabited by an unknown entity the mere description of whom was enough to make us behave for days on end. Mrs. DeBose was plain hell. So if you ever had boundaries when you were a kid of where you could play um, for... Um, our, for Scout and Jem, it was the Radley House and Mrs. DeBose's. And they were both scary, so they never wanted to um, go any further. That was the summer Dill came to us. Early one morning as we were beginning our day's play in the backyard, Jem and I heard something next door in Miss Rachel Haverford's collared patch. We went to the wire fence to see if there was a puppy. Miss Rachel's rat terror was expecting, aww. Instead, we found someone looking, or someone sitting looking at us. Sitting down, he wasn't much higher than the collards. We, sp we stared at him until he spoke. Hey. Hey, yourself, said Jem pleasantly. I'm Charles Baker Harris, he said. I can read. So what, I said. Just thought you'd like to know I can read. You got anything that needs reading, I can do it. How old are you, asked Jem. Four and a half? Going on seven. Shoot, no wonder then, said Jem, jerking his thumb at me. Scout Yonder's been reading ever since she was born, and she ain't even started school yet. You look right puny for going on seven. I'm little, but I'm old, he said. So we've got this, these like kids interacting for the first time. And first things first, do you think Scout's been reading since she was born? No. What we want to start noting about Jem is sometimes being the older one, he thinks he knows everything, but um, he's going to like, make up stuff and because he's the oldest all the other kids are like oh okay um the other thing that always cracks me up here is like like the way that like children start conversations which i think is going to be one of our first little um classroom feed um share outs is anytime how many of you have had a sibling or a cousin or someone you've babysat say like the weirdest most um non-related thing ever like my friend's daughter once I walked into her house she's five well she was five at the time and just walked up to me and said hey Sarah I had gum yesterday I'm like cool talk um so I want you to post in the feed the funny things that kids have started conversations with you using all right so we've got Jem bragging about Scout being able to read and then he's like you look really little Dill and he says I'm little but I'm old Jem brushed his hair, hair back to get a better look why don't you come over, Charles Baker Harris? He said, Lord, what a name. It's not any funnier than yours. Aunt Rachel said, your name's Jeremy Atticus Finch. Jem scowled. I'm big enough to fit mine, he said. Your name's longer than you are. I bet it's a foot longer. Folks call me Dill, said Dill, struggling under the fence. Do better if you go over it and sit under it, I said. Where'd you come from? Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi, was spending the summer with his aunt, Miss Rachel, and would be spending every summer in Macon from now on. His family was from Maycomb County originally. His mother worked for a photographer in Meridian, had entered his picture in a beautiful child contest and won $5. She gave the money to Dill, who went to the picture show 20 times on it. Don't have any picture shows here except Jesus ones in the courthouse, said Jem. Ever seen anything good? Another thing about Maycomb, maybe not a ton of separation between church and state. Dill had seen Dracula, a revelation that moved Jem to eye him with the beginning of respect. Tell it to us, he said. Dill was a curiosity. He wore blue linen shorts that buttoned to his shirt. His hair was snow white and stuck to his head like duck fluff. He was a year my senior, but I towered over him. As he told us the old tale, his blue eyes would lighten and darken. His laugh was sudden and happy. He habitually pulled at a cowlick at the center of his forehead. When Dill reduced Dracula to dust and Jem said the show sounded better than the book, I asked Dill where his father was. Another weird conversation started with kids. You ain't said anything about him. I haven't got one. Is he dead? No. Then if he's not dead, you've got one, haven't you? Dill blushed and Jem told me to hush, a sure sign Dill had been studied and found acceptable. 
Thereafter, the summer passed in routine contentment. Routine contentment was improving our treehouse that rested between giant twin chinaberry trees in the backyard, fussing, running through our list of dramas based on the works of Oliver Optic, Victor Appleton, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. In this matter, we were lucky to have Dill. He played the character parts formerly thrust upon me, the ape in Tarzan, Mr. Crabtree in the Rover Boys, Mr. Damon in Tom Swift. Thus, we came to know Dill as a pocket Merlin whose head teemed with eccentric plans, strange longings, and quaint fancies. By the end of August, our repertoire was vapid from countless reproductions, and it was then that Dill gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. The Radley place fascinated Dill. In spite of our warnings and explanations, it drew him as the moon draws water, but drew him no nearer than the light pole on the corner, a safe distance from the Radley gate. There he would stand, his arm around the fat pole, staring and wondering. The Radley place jutted into a sharp curve beyond our house, walking south, one faced its porch. The sidewalk turned and ran beside the lot. The house was low, was once white with a deep front porch and gray shutters, but had long ago darkened to the color of the slate gray yard around it. Rain-rotted shingles drooped over the eaves of the veranda. Oak trees kept the sun away. The, pic the remains of a picket, picket fence, drunkenly guarded the front yard, a swept yard that was never swept, where Johnson grass and rabbit tobacco grew in abundance. Now that is a Southern Gothic uh, building, if I've ever heard one. Doesn't it sound a lot like my advanced people? Doesn't it sound like Miss Emily's house? Do, 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 do. Where was I? Inside the house lived a malevolent phantom. People said he existed, but Gemini had never seen him. People said he went out at night when the moon was down and peeped into windows. When people's azaleas froze in a cold snap, it was because he had breathed on them. Any stealthy small crimes committed in Macon were his work. Once the town was terrorized by a series of mor morbid nocturnal events. People's chickens and household pets were found mutilated. Although the culprit was Crazy Addy, who eventually drowned himself in Barker's Eddy, people still looked at the, ne or at the Radley place, unwilling to discard their initial suspicions. A Negro would, would not pass the Radley place at night. He would cut across to the sidewalk opposite and whistle as he walked. We're going to talk about that word. Um, it's used in this text, um, but is not a word that we use conversationally anymore. I've got a little reading about it, but we'll get back to that. The Maycomb school grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot from the Radley chicken yard. Tall pecan trees shook their fruit into the schoolyard, but the nuts lay untouched by the children. Radley pecans would kill you. A baseball hit into the Radley yard was a lost ball and no questions asked. Every time I read this out loud, I say, what does that remind you of? Every single time, 100% people say, Sandlot, yep, you're right. The misery of that house began many years before Jem and I were born. The Radleys, welcome anywhere in town, kept to themselves. A practice, predilection, unforgivable in Maycomb. Another thing we're learning about Maycomb, everybody's supposed to socialize with everybody. They did not go to church, Maycomb's principal recreation, but worshipped at home. Mrs. Radley seldom if ever crossed the street for a mid-morning coffee break with her neighbors and certainly never joined a missionary circle. Mr. Radley walked to town at 11.30 every morning and came back promptly at 12, sometimes carrying a brown paper bag that the neighborhood assumed contained the family groceries. I never knew how old Mr. Radley made his living. Jem said he bought cotton, a polite term for doing nothing, but Mr. Radley and his wife had lived there with their two sons as long as anybody could remember. The shutters of the Radley house were closed on Sundays, another thing alien to Maycomb's ways. Closed doors meant illness and cold weather only. Of all days, Sunday was the day for formal afternoon visiting. Ladies wore corsets, men wore coats, children wore shoes. But to climb the Radley front steps and call, hey, of a Sunday afternoon was something their neighbors never did. The Radley house had no screen doors. I once asked Atticus if it ever had any. Atticus said yes, but before I was born. According to neighborhood legend, when the younger Radley boy was in his teens, he became acquainted with some of the Cunninghams from Old Sarum, which is going to be another part of the county. An enormous and confusing tribe domiciled in the northern part of the county. Then they formed the nearest thing to a gang ever seen in Maycomb. Let's know how hardcore this gang is. They did little, but enough to be discussed by the town and public, publicly warned from three pulpits. Pulpits are going to be like um, the podium from where um, a religious leader will preach. So not only were they talked about, like everybody in the town's like, did you? 
and the the priests or religious leaders will be like, and if you're a part of the gang in Old Serum, you better not be, blah, blah, blah. It's a terrible impression. I'll have to work on that one. They hung around the barber shop. They rode the bus to Abbotsville on Sundays and went to the picture show. They attended dances at the county's Riverside Gambling Hall, the Dewdrop Inn and Fishing Camp. They experimented with stump hole whiskey. Nobody in Maycomb had nerve enough to tell Mr. Radley that his boy was in with the wrong crowd. One night, in an, ex an excessive burst of spirit, high spirits, which is going to be alcohol in this case, the boys backed around the square in a borrowed fliver, a car, resisted arrest by Maycomb's ancient beetle, Mr. Connor. It's kind of going to be like the, the order keeper, the unofficial, like, um, it's, I think beetle I have actually is one of your vocab terms too. And locked him in the courthouse outhouse. The town decided something had to be done. Mr. Connor said he knew who each and every one of them was, and he was bound and determined they wouldn't get away with it. So the boys came before the probate judge on charges of disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, assault and battery, and using abusive and profane language in the presence and hearing of a female, which was actually a law back then. Mr. Connor said they cussed so loud he was sure every lady in Maycomb heard them. The judge decided to send the boys to the state industrial school where boys are sometimes sent for no other reason than to provide them with food and decent shelter. It was no prison, and it was no disgrace. Mr. Radley thought it was. If the judge released Arthur, Mr. Radley would see to it that Arthur gave no further trouble. Knowing that Mr. Radley's word was his bond, the judge was glad to do so. The other boys attended the industrial school and received the best secondary education to be had in the state. One of them eventually worked his way through engineering school at Auburn. The doors of the Radley house were closed on weekdays as well as Sundays, and Mr. Radley's boy was not seen again for 15 years. Wait, what? 15 years. Remember that number. But there came a day barely within Jim's memory when Boo Radley was heard from and was seen by several people, but not by Jim. He said Atticus never talked much about the Radleys when Jim would question him. Atticus's only answer was to him, for him to mind his own business and let the Radleys mind theirs. They had a right to. But when it happened, Jem said Atticus shook his head and said, mm, mm, mm. So, Jem received most of his information from Miss Stephanie Crawford, a neighborhood scold, neighborhood gossip, who said she knew the whole thing. According to Miss Stephanie, Boo was sitting in the living room, cutting up some items from the Maycomb Tribune to paste in a scrapbook. His father entered the room. As Mr. Radley passed by, Boo drove the scissors into his parents' leg, pulled him out, wiped him on his pants, and resumed his activities. Mrs. Radley ran in, screaming into the street that Arthur was killing them all. But when the sheriff arrived, he found Boo still sitting in the living room, cutting up the Tribune. He was 33 years old then. Miss Stephanie said old Mr. Radley said no Radley was going to any asylum when it was suggested that a season in Tuscaloosa might be helpful to Boo. All right, a couple things here. Before mental health was what it is now, um, when you were deemed um, insane, which was the term they used, they would send you to an insane asylum, which I'm sure you've heard before. Um, I have a really interesting article about like what these asylums were like, um, which I will put into Google Classroom. But we want to make sure that we are understanding here that to send their son to an insane asylum was um, like outing their son as having some sort of a problem and especially back then it was very taboo so um they don't want to send him to one of these asylums so here's what they do instead boo wasn't crazy he was high strung at times it was all right to shut him up mr radley conceded but insisted boo not be charged with anything he was not a criminal the sheriff hadn't the heart to put him in jail alongside negroes jim crow law era remember that so boo was locked in the courthouse basement Boo tran Boo's transition from the basement to back home was nebulous, was cloudy in Jem's memory. Miss Stephanie Crawford said some of the town council told Mr. Radley if he didn't take Boo back, Boo would die of mold from the damp. Besides, Boo could not live forever on the bounty of the county. Nobody knew what form of intimidation Boo Mr. Radley employed to keep Boo out of sight, but Jem figured that Mr. Radley kept him chained to the bed most of the time. Attica said no, it wasn't that sort of thing, but there were other ways of making people into ghosts. My memory came alive to see Mrs. Radley occasionally open the front door, walk to the edge of the porch, and pour water on her canas. But every day, Jim and I would see Mr. Radley walking to and from town. He was a thin, leathery man with colorless eyes, so colorless they did not reflect light. His cheekbones were sharp and his mouth was wide, with a thin upper lip and a full lower lip. 
Miss Stephanie Crawford said he was so upright. He took the word of God as his only law, and we believed her because Mr. Radley's posture was ramrod straight. So he, like, walks, like, very, like, upright. He never spoke to us. When he passed, he would look at the ground, or we would look at the ground and say, Good morning, sir. And he would cough and reply. Mr. Radley's elder son lived in Pensacola. He came home at Christmas, and he was one of the few persons we ever saw leave or enter the place. From the day Mr. Radley took Arthur home, people said the house died. But there was a day when Atticus told us he'd wear us out if we made any noise in the yard and commissioned Calpurnia to serve in his absence if she heard a sound out of us. Mr. Radley was dying. So this is going to be the dad. So we've got mom and dad Radley, and then we've got Arthur and Nathan. Arthur, parentheses, boo. The kids call him Boo, but his real name's Arthur. He took his time about it. Wooden sawhorses blocked the road at each end of the Radley lot. It's going to be like road blockers. Straw was put down on the sidewalk. Traffic was diverted to the back street. Dr. Reynolds parked his, tar his, ca la la la, his car in front of our house and walked to the Radleys every time he called. Jem and I crept around the yard for days. At last, the sawhorses were taken away, and we stood watching from the front porch when Mr. Radley made his final journey past our house. There goes the meanest man God ever blew breath into, murmured Calpurnia. And she spat meditatively into the yard. We looked at her in surprise, for Calpurnia never commented on the ways of white people. Okay, we've got um, an inference we got to make right now. Calpurnia is black. Everybody else you've met so far is white. The, Cal er, the neighborhood thought when Mr. Radley went under, Boo would come out, but it had another thing coming. Boo's elder brother returned from Pensacola and took Mr. Radley's place. The only difference between him and his father was their ages. Jem said Mr. Nathan Radley bought cotton, too. Mr. Nathan would speak to us, however. And when we said good morning, when we said good morning, and sometimes we saw him come in from town with a magazine in his hand. The more we told Dill about the Radleys, the more he wanted to know. The longer he would stand hugging the light pole in the corner, the more he would wonder. I wonder what he does in there, he would murmur. Looks like he just stick his head out the door. Jem said, he goes out all right when it's pitch dark. Miss Stephanie Crawford said she woke up in the middle of the night one time and saw him looking straight through the window at her. She said his head was like a skull looking at her. Ain't you ever waked up at night and heard him, Dill? He walks like this. Jem's going to do a zombie walk impression here. Slid his feet, his feet through the gravel. Why do you think Miss Rachel locks up so tight at night? I've seen his tracks in our backyard many a morning. And one night, I heard him scratching on the back door, but he was gone by the time Atticus got there. Wonder what he looks like, said Dill. Jem gave a reasonable description of Dill, or of Boo, sorry. Boo was about six and a half feet tall, judging from his tracks. He dined on raw squirrels and any cats he could catch. That's why his hands were blood stained. If you ate an animal raw, you could never wash the blood off. There was a long, jagged scar that ran across his face. What teeth he had were yellow and rotten. His eyes popped and he drooled most of the time. Let's try to make him come out, said Dill. I'd like to see what he looks like. Jem said if Dill wanted to get himself killed, all he had to do was go up and knock on the front door. Our first raid came to pass only because Dill bet Jem the Grey Ghost against two Tom Swifts that Jem wouldn't get any further than the Radley Gate. In all his life, Jem had never declined a dare. So there, that's their version of like double, triple dog daring. Jem thought about it for three days. I suppose he loved honor more than his head, for Dill warmed down easily. You're scared, Dill said the first day. Ain't scared, just respectful, Jem said. The next day, Dill said, you're too scared to even put your big toe in the front yard. Jem said he reckoned he wasn't. He passed the Radley place every school day of his life. Always running, I said. But Dill got him on the third day when he told Jem that folks in Meridian certainly weren't as afraid as the folks in Maycomb, that he'd never seen such scary folks as the ones in Maycomb. This was enough to make Jem march to the corner where he stopped and leaned against the light pole watching the gate hang crazily on its homemade hinge. I hope you got it through your head that he'll kill us each and every one, Dill Harris said Jem when he joined him when we joined him. Don't blame me when he gouges your eyes out. You started it, remember. You're still scared, murmured Dill patiently. Jem wanted Dill to know once and for all he wasn't scared of anything. It's just I can't think of a way to make him come out without him getting us. Besides, Jem had his little sister to think of. When he said that I knew he was afraid. Jem had his little sister to think of the time I dared him to jump off the top of the house. If I got killed, what would become of you, he asked. Then he jumped, landed unhurt, and his sense of, of responsibility left him until confronted by the Radley place. So he always uses protecting his sister as an excuse when he's too scared. You gonna run out on a dare, asked Dill. If you are, then... Dill, you have to think about these things, Jem said. 
Let me think a minute. It's sort of like making a turtle come out. How's that? Asked Dill. Strike a match under him. I told Jim if he set fire to the Radley house, I was going to tell Atticus on him. Dill said striking a match under a turtle was hateful. Ain't hateful, just persuades him. It's not like you chunk him into the fire, Jim growled. How do you know a match don't hurt him? Turtles can't feel, stupid, said Jem. Turtles can feel. You're stupid. Were you ever a turtle? Hmm? My stars, Dill, now let me think. Reckon we can rock him. Jem stood in, the th in thought so long that Dill made a mild concession. I won't say you ran out on a dare, and I'll swap you the gray ghost if you just go up and touch the house. Jem brightened. Touch the house, that's all? Dill nodded. Sure, that's all. No, I don't want you hollering something different the minute I get back. Yeah, that's all, said Dill. He'll probably come out after you and when he sees you in the yard, then Scout and me will jump on him and hold him down till we can tell him we ain't going to hurt him. We left the corner, crossed the side street that ran in front of the Radley house, and stopped at the gate. Go on, said Dill. Scout and me's right behind you. I'm going, said Jem. Don't hurry me. He walked to the corner of the lot, then back again, studying the simple terrain as if deciding how best to effect an entry, frowning and scratching his head. Then I sneered at him. Jem threw open the gate and sped to the side of the house, slapped it with his palm, and ran back to it, past us, not waiting to see if his foray was successful. Dill and I followed on his heels. Safely on our porch, panting and out of breath, we looked back. The old house was the same, droopy and sick, but as we stared down the street, we thought we saw an inside shutter move. Flick a tiny, almost invisible movement, and the house was still. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, ask any questions in the comments on uh, Google Classroom. The questions are also attached there. Um, just remember, we're looking at um, purpose, illusion, and characterization, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, and then the last thing I'll tell you is um, I'm taking a page out of Mr. Nemi's book, and it was something he had on the announcements before we were let out of school, and said something about when you're having a bad day or when you're sad, that sometimes going out and doing something for someone else can make you feel better. And I have been trying every day to, to purposely do something nice for someone else, and I challenge you to do it too, because it's really been helping me. I think when we're forced to sit in isolation, it's easy to isolate and think about our own problems and what we're worried about with this entire um, pandemic. And I think reaching out to other people and trying to connect with them and check on them is a way that we can not feel so isolated in our existence right now. Um, so let's see. I'll kind of tell you, I've, I'm a big card sender, so I've been sending some cards out to people, and then I um, actually DM'd a, a teacher on Twitter a couple days ago, and when I was a student teacher, she was teaching at the school that I student taught, and she came over, and she complimented me at the end of the period, and I never forgot that compliment, and I never told her, and I messaged her and told her that. She's like, I don't remember that at all, and so I think um, if you can try to... Um, Go out of your way to do something to brighten someone else's day. I guarantee you it will brighten yours too. Anyway, I love you. I miss you. And I can't wait to see you soon. Let me know if you need anything at all. See you tomorrow on Couch Classroom.